I don't want people to think that we're the nasty sort of baddies. I want them to think that we're the cool kind of baddies. A lot of the ideas we believe about pirates are exactly what they themselves wanted to be viewed as. In part two of this series, we're going to look at how these ideas were popularised. The literature and media which made pirates cool. But I just don't get it, Captain. When we're doing our stealing and murdering and striking fear and terror into the hearts of men, it'll all be caught on camera, on CCTV. But the thing is, when we do our stealing and murdering and striking fear and terror into the hearts of men, it'll be cool. <laughs> we'll get loads. In the first part of this mini-series, I explored some of the myths surrounding pirates and how these have contributed to their great PR. In this video, I want to explore how these ideas were popularised, the literature and media which made pirates cool. We've always had a fascination with pirates. Just as we love to consume media about serial killers and gangsters today, our fascination with depravity and transgression is a running theme throughout social history. And the public of the 18th and 19th centuries had an insatiable and immediate appetite for pirates. Ever since we learnt to print cheaply and on a large scale, we've been printing things about... Pirates! 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 There you are! Sorry about that! No, Polly. Pirates. Folk songs about pirates were collected and mass-produced as broadside ballads, with some of them still sung today. Pirates also became popular as characters in theatre, with Pericles, a Christian-turned-Turk, and Fortune by Land and Sea all featuring pirates and printed as books. Pamphlets were also hugely popular and the main form of mass-produced media, the 17th century equivalent of tabloids. Examples include an exact narrative of the trials of the pirates, a true relation of the lives and deaths of two most famous English pirates, and the trials of Captain John Rackham and other pirates. Pamphlets like these were widespread and the main medium for political and social discourse. The very first collection of famous pirates was published in 1724, titled A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates. Published in the waning years of the Pirate Golden Age, the often embellished accounts of the lives of many infamous pirates proved an instant hit, was translated internationally, and just two years after it was first published, there was already an updated fourth edition. The huge public interest in pirates led to a deluge of literature, media and theatre. But this wasn't like us watching Pirates of the Caribbean, something that happened 300 years ago. This was happening in real time. You could go watch the execution of a pirate in the morning and then buy a pamphlet detailing his exploits in the afternoon. In a way, pirates became a stock character, utilised extensively alongside their other favourite stock character, Highwaymen. Both characters appealed, and still do, to a sense of the exotic and familiar. On the one hand, we can relate to them. They were ordinary people just like us, from similar backgrounds, just poor adventurers trying to make it rich and resist the authorities. But on the other, they experienced places and events which we could never experience ourselves. The vast ocean, the open road, fame and fortune, exciting battles. All elements of life largely absent from our own. Hence, the pirate life became the perfect setting for adventure stories, regardless of whether the pirate characters were the heroes or the villains. Famous writers like Daniel Defoe, Lord Byron, Walter Scott, Edgar Allan Poe and J.M. Barrie all wrote about pirates. The most famous and influential is, of course, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, published as a novel in 1883. Drawing on elements popularised by earlier works, 
Treasure Island was a quintessential boy's own adventure novel, framing piracy as a thrilling escapade and permanently changing the way we view pirates. Tropes like treasure maps, peg legs, parrots, the black spot, the Jolly Roger, though not all invented by Treasure Island, became permanently ingrained into the popular consciousness by it. Right, Polly, let me just put you down there. Treasure Island still remains an almost perfect pirate story. It's so important and so foundational to the world of pirate storytelling that everything that came after it felt like it was copying it. And so it's no surprise that with the invention of moving pictures, Treasure Island would become the most popular pirate story on the screen, adapted over 50 times around the world. In fact, there's something a bit irresistible about Treasure Island. We just can't stop adapting it for TV and film. Here's just a few. Of all the tropes that Treasure Island gave us, I think the most egregious is the idea that all pirates spoke with a pirate accent, by which I mean a West Country accent. For those unfamiliar with the UK, that means this part. Part of this makes sense. Some pirates were from the West Country, and places like Bristol and Portsmouth were major maritime ports throughout history. But pirates formed an incredibly diverse society. Wherever you found sailors, you found pirates. In terms of English pirates, for example, about a third were from London. But we insist on portraying pirates as though they all came from one part of England. Part of the reason for this is that in the 1950 adaption of Treasure Island, the actor Robert Newton, who was from the West Country, used his native accent when playing Long John Silver, and it stuck. We're waiting while a first-class navigator like Captain Smollett sails his ear bamboo to our destination. OK, so we love Treasure Island, but that's only one part of the wider domination pirates had for decades over cinema. Here's just a few of the non-Treasure Island films released during that time. Trust me, there were way more than I could have fitted in there. But as you can see, pirate films boomed from the 1920s to the 1960s, a four-decade domination of the silver screen. Before there were spaghetti westerns, there were spaghetti Jolly Rogers. And I haven't even talked about TV. A strong theme which emerges from this early period of pirate filmmaking is of the dashing, handsome, bad boy pirate who romances the gorgeous female lead. The pirate in public imagination was transformed from brutal criminal to dashing and irresistible rogue. I personally do not go for a bad boy, but that Gina Davis in Cutthroat Island, I could go for a bit of pillage from her. Like its sister genre, the Western, pirate films began to decline and were seen as a little passé before being reinvented through films which reinterpreted the genre. Whilst pirate films have always appealed to the desire for rebellion, it's in the modern era of filmmaking that this has really come to the fore. The Pirates of the Caribbean franchise pits their protagonists against the might of the Royal Navy, framing the pirates as the heroes and the navy as the villains. This is still the general trend for modern pirate media, with the rebelliousness of the pirates against authority a running theme. Generally, the appeal of pirates remains largely unchanged from the earliest literature. Let's return to the quotation which kicked off this series. As Marcus Redeker writes in his History of Atlantic Piracy, We love pirates most of all because they were rebels. They challenged, in one way or another, the conventions of class, 
race, gender, and nation. They abolished the wage, established a different discipline, practiced their own kind of democracy and equality. Pirates opposed the high and mighty of their day, and by their actions became the villains of all nations. We know that this isn't exactly an accurate view of pirates. I'd spent a whole video explaining why not, but it's certainly correct in how we imagine pirates. Pirates speak to a forbidden rebellion, the desire to reject authority and do things your own way. We can, just as the readers of the earliest pirate literature, vicariously experience their freedom and self-defined lifestyle. We can be a dashing swashbuckler, a brave rebel, or the gorgeous love interest who falls for the handsome rogue. In the process of making this video, I babysat some young relatives and watched kids' TV with them. One of the programmes was a pirate-themed children's game show, and I wondered, would we ever make a children's game show about Somalian pirates? Or modern-day gangsters? Probably not. But because these pirates have gone through a 300-year-long image-cleansing process, we view them as harmless fun. But let's hear an account from some actual victims of piracy. Samuel Carey was a captain and owner of a trading ship which sailed out of London in 1720, with a cargo worth close to a million pounds in today's money. His ship was captured off the coast of Newfoundland by Bartholomew Roberts. Telling his story to a Boston newspaper, he watched as the pirates held everyone at gunpoint and forced them to strip. They tore through the cargo like a parcel of furies, taking whatever they wanted and throwing the rest into the sea, threatening, swearing, cursing and blaspheming, full of madness and rage. They kidnapped at gunpoint some of his crew and forced them into service on their ships. They ate and drank everything on board, and, seeking diversion, for mischief is their sole delight, they created for themselves a late-night fireworks show, setting his ship on fire and watching as it sank. Carey was spared and allowed to escape on a passing ship. This is just one account, but these events were replicated hundreds if not thousands of times across the Americas and the Atlantic, and it's still happening today. The film Captain Phillips, though not an entirely accurate retelling, is nevertheless a harrowing insight into the modern victims of piracy. I'm not saying that we should stop watching pirate films, or dressing up as pirates, or building Lego pirate ships, but we should do so with the full awareness that we're engaging in a largely fictional and sanitised view of piracy. That, over 300 years later, we're still buying into their own PR. But you can keep them for the birds and bees Cos I want money That's, that's what I want that's